Hello, I am Dr. Pulkit Mathur and I am from Lady Irwin College, University of Delhi. Today, I will be giving you an overview about food hazards. The outline of the presentation includes classification of hazards, sources of contamination, harmful effects, reducing exposure to hazards and emerging concerns regarding food safety. Food hazards are anything in our food that can adversely affect our health. These can be classified as physical, chemical and biological hazards. Coming on to physical hazards first, straw, husk, foreign seeds, stone chips, sand, metal chips, filings, nails, pins, shards of glass, pieces of plastic that may fall off from processing equipment, also from packaging or due to improper handling, pieces of bone, hair, feathers, insects, eggs, droppings of pests, other foreign matter like beady, matchstick, fabric etc. There are certain adverse effects of physical hazards. The health effects include Hard materials like pieces of stone may chip the tooth enamel. Straw, twigs, husk if swallowed may lodge themselves in or irritate the intestine. Iron filings, glass shards can perforate the lining of the intestine and lead to serious problems. There can be economic losses too due to cost of medical treatment and also court trials when the consumer sues the company for any of the physical hazards being found in food. Of course, there is loss of brand value and also customer loyalty. Moving on to chemical hazards. These include pesticide residues, veterinary drug residues, heavy metals, cleaning chemicals which come from the chemicals that we use for cleaning our equipment and uh, processing plants, chemicals which leach from equipment or packaging into the food, chemicals which are produced during processing of food and some naturally occurring chemicals which may be present in plant or animal foods. These chemical contaminants can enter our food chain because of agricultural chemicals being used, veterinary drugs being used, industrial wastes being thrown into the soil, air and water, as well as chemical wastes from households and untreated sewage. The plants growing in this soil as well as the animals feeding on these plants can get contaminated by these various chemical contaminants. Man is on top of the food chain and when he consumes these contaminated plants and animals, he too then receives all these toxins. Pesticides Pesticides are used to protect food from pests such as insects, rodents, weeds, mold and bacteria. A significant amount of these chemicals leach into the rivers and other water bodies from farms. When these pesticides are sprayed on standing crop, they may also enter and collect in the soil. Pesticides are known to cause cancer, bird defects, liver damage, endocrine disruption resulting in reduced sperm count, sterility, miscarriage and even nerve damage. Pesticides can be classified according to the pest they are used to control. For instance, insecticides are used to control insects, rodenticides to control rodents like rats, mice, moles, herbicides to control weeds and fungicides to control the mold and the fungus. Based on their chemical nature, pesticides can also be classified as organochlorine pesticides, organophosphates and carbamates, pyrethrins and pyrethroids. In addition, a large number of inorganic pesticides are also in use. Why are foods contaminated with pesticides? Mainly, this is due to the indiscriminate use of pesticides 
mainly due to ignorance about a certain things. Number one is ignorance about what are good agricultural practices and most importantly, what is the observance of the prescribed waiting period. This waiting period before you harvest the crops is needed because pesticides take some time to dissipate and disappear. If we harvest the crops before the waiting period is over, then the level of pesticides is much higher in the crop. Also, farmers are not aware about what is the right concentration of the pesticide to put. If they put too high a concentration or if they spray the pesticide more frequently than is needed, then also the amount of residues is much higher. Farmers are also unaware about the safest pesticide to use. In addition, effluents from pesticide manufacturing units add to the pollution levels. Sometimes distributors and people marketing the uh, food products also treat grains, fruits and vegetables post-harvest. This can also result in high pesticide residues. How to decrease exposure to pesticides? Household or industrial level processing may either increase or decrease the level of pesticides in foods. Washing and peeling, for instance, has been shown to remove pesticides adhering to surfaces. Cooking further reduces these levels. Hulling and polishing of rice, milling of wheat also reduces the concentration of pesticides. Juicing and canning also tends to lower the residue levels. Coming on to what are veterinary drug residues. Now, livestock is treated with a number of drugs either to treat some kind of an infection or illness or hormones are used to further the growth of these livestock. It takes some time for the drug to be metabolized and broken down to harmless substances in the animal's body. It is important to wait for a specified period of time till the drug comes out of the animal's biological system before milking or slaughtering the animal. Otherwise, the milk, meat and eggs of the animal are likely to contain residues. The veterinary drug residues can be classified as antibiotics, anti-cocicidials, ectoparasiticides, anti-helminthics, antifungal agents and hormones. How do these veterinary drug residues enter the food chain? When these drugs are added to feed additives or given to the animals in therapeutic doses either orally, intravenously or intradermally, these may also be sprayed or dusted on animals, on their feed or on their surroundings. These all then result in residues in meat, milk, egg and honey. Adverse effects. Residues of antibiotics may result in the development of resistance to antibiotics. They may also be linked to allergic reactions in some sensitive people. For instance, penicillin is a drug which many people are allergic to. If penicillin residues are there in food products, then people, these people who are sensitive to penicillin may actually react to these foods as well. These uh, residues may also interfere with bacterial cultures which are used to make cheese and curd. They can also result in environmental contamination. When animals who have been treated with hormones excrete these hormones into the surrounding water and man in turn consumes this water, it can lead to endocrine disruption in humans. There have been instances of acute poisoning outbreaks as well. Lyon in France witnessed an out such an outbreak in which people experienced symptoms of tremor, headaches, abnormally rapid heart rate and dizziness one to three hours after eating veal liver which was contaminated with clenbuterol residues. How do we reduce exposure to these veterinary drugs? Definitely by following good veterinary practices, which means 
that a veterinarian is consulted before these drugs are administered to the livestock. Over medication is avoided. Appropriate time gap, which is known as the withdrawal time, is given between administering the drug and milking or slaughtering the animal. Drug manufacturers are required to provide tissue residue and depletion rate data for all new drugs. This information then has to be passed on to the livestock rearer. The drug manufacturers also need to provide a method to detect the residues in tissues which can be then used by the regulatory authorities. Processing of food like washing, freezing, cooking can reduce the amount of veterinary drug residues in our food products. There are regulatory provisions for all these chemical contaminants. A maximum residue limit known as MRL which is the maximum allowable concentration of a chemical in the feed or food at a specified time of slaughter or harvesting processing, storage or marketing up to the time of consumption by animal or human. In India, the food safety and standards, contaminants, toxins and residues regulation 2011 deals with compliance to standards set for various contaminants, toxins which include microbial and naturally occurring toxins and residues of pesticides, veterinary drugs and other pharmacologically active substances in food. Coming on to heavy metals. The heavy metals of concern are arsenic, lead, mercury, cadmium, chromium, copper, nickel and tin. Now these enter the food chain because of industries which release effluents into the water bodies, smoke into the air or bury their waste in soil. Vehicles which use leaded fuels like petrol releasing lead into the air or exhaust which contaminates the plants which are growing near roads. Various utensils and containers made of metals including cooking utensils can leach these metals into the food. Pipes, tanks carrying or storing water can also leach the heavy metals into the water. Untreated sewage and sludge can, which is used for irrigation or released into water bodies can add to the contamination levels of the water. Heavy metal poisoning outbreaks in history are well documented. Mercury toxicity led to the Minamata disease outbreak in Japan where fish contaminated with methyl mercury was consumed. Cadmium toxicity led to the itai itai, also known as the ouch ouch disease in Japan, where rice which had been irrigated with cadmium contaminated water was consumed. Arsenic poisoning has been seen in Taiwan, where people were exposed via the drinking water. This led to a severe disease of the blood vessels, and even gangrene and was known as the Blackfoot disease. Arsenic poisoning is very common in West Bengal and Bangladesh where the groundwater is contaminated with arsenic. It leads to these kind of skin lesions. This figure shows how mercury enters the food chain. Volcanic eruptions, discharge from coal plants and mines, enters the seawater Mercury in the form of methyl mercury is then consumed by the krill, algae, plankton. These krill, algae and plankton are then consumed by small fish which are further eaten by the larger fish and thus the mercury moves up the food chain. As it moves up the food chain, there is bioconcentration of mercury and the larger fish actually turn up with much higher levels of mercury. How do we reduce exposure to heavy metals? Certain plants or microorganisms which accumulate heavy metals from soils by concentrating them in their biomatter can be made use of. Phasing out use of heavy metals in fuel and industry is the need of the hour. In fact, now petrol is sold as unleaded petrol. 
Folic acid supplementation may reduce the risk of arsenic related health outcomes as certain studies have shown. Studies have also shown that an improved nutritional status could actually constitute a key strategy in reducing the toxic effects which are seen in people. Avoiding farm produce grown in contaminated soil is important. In fact, wherever the soil is contaminated, it should not be permitted for use for growing foods to be consumed by either animals or man. Choosing smaller fish to consume and green leafy vegetables with smaller leaves is much more preferred because of lower amounts of heavy metals in these food products. Utensils made of only good quality alloys should be used for cooking, processing and storage. There should be a crackdown on polluting industries. Treatment of sewage or sludge to decrease the load of heavy metals is also important. Safe and responsible disposal of electronics and batteries is also important. Contaminated groundwater should be treated before consumption. FSSAI specifies the maximum amount of heavy metal permissible in each kind of food. We now come to naturally occurring toxicants in plant foods. There are several plant foods in which there are some toxins present which can result in adverse health effects. These are some examples. Consumption of fava beans, for instance, has been shown to cause favism. Cotton seed oil has a toxic chemical called cosipol. Mustard oil has erucic acid. Bitter cucumber, bitter squash, zucchini, bottle gourd have toxic cucurbitacins. Lathyrus sativus or kesari dal can cause lathyrism because of a toxic amino acid. Toxic amino acids can also cause mushroom poisoning. Argemon mexicana has a toxic alkaloid compound like called sanguinary. This can lead to epidemic dropsy. Argemon seeds are often used as an adulterant in mustard seeds or mustard oil. The green portions of potatoes have glycoalkaloids, example solanine, which is also toxic to human beings. There are naturally occurring toxicants in animal foods as well. This is a picture of a puffer fish or a blowfish and the second picture is that of different kinds of shellfish. Shellfish poisoning can result because of toxins present in shellfish. Scromboid poisoning is because of improperly stored or decayed seafood. Sigwatra fish poisoning is caused by the Sigwatra toxin which is produced by the dinoflagellates. Small fish feed on these and then big fish feed on the small fish thus bioconcentrating the toxin. Puffer fish poisoning or blowfish poisoning is caused by tetrodotoxin. This is actually this fish is actually eaten as a delicacy but can even lead to death of the person. Hallucinogenic fish poisoning can occur by eating fish which has fed on certain algae and plankton. Certain anti-nutritional factors may also be present in foods. Enzyme inhibitors, for instance, interfere with the functioning of protein digesting enzymes, thus decreasing digestion, absorption and utilization. Anti-metals like phytates and oxalates bind to metals and decrease their absorption. Tannins interfere with the absorption of minerals like iron and reduce the availability of proteins by binding to them. Goitrogens or antithyroid substances interfere with the uptake of iodine by the thyroid gland. Hemagglutinins have the property of agglutinating red blood cells. How do we reduce exposure to these anti-nutritional factors? Well, most anti-nutritional factors present in foods can easily be destroyed by cooking. Germination and fermentation of grains reduces the phytate content. 
Removing the seed coat of legumes can also reduce the phytate and tannin content. Decreasing the intake of tea and tamarind also decreases the tannin intake. Now there are certain chemicals which are actually produced during the processing of foods. Advanced glycation end products are produced when animal fats or plant foods are cooked at high temperatures to the point of browning or crisping. These have been implicated in atherosclerosis, aging of the skin, increased oxidative stress and inflammation. Acrylamide is formed whenever foods that contain the amino acid asparagine and any reactive carbohydrate are heated at temperatures greater than 120 degrees centigrade. Mostly your starch-based foods like potato, bread, bakery products and breakfast cereal, cocoa-based products and coffee are especially likely to contain acrylamide. Acrylamide causes DNA damage, neurological and reproductive damage and is a probable carcinogen. Heterocyclic amines are formed from pyrolysis of amino acids and proteins at high temperature in muscle tissues of animals. These may also be formed in plant-based foods when they are browned or charred. Nitrosamines are formed when nitrates or nitrites combine with amino acids on exposure to high temperatures during cooking, example grilling or frying. Drying, salting, smoking or curing of food also promotes formation of nitrosamines. Nitrosamines have been shown to produce cancer in experimental animals. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons are formed during grilling or charring of food, especially meats. Foods found with the highest concentration of these are include grilled, smoked meat or fish, smoked or cured cheese, etc. Now this tells us that if your bread is over toasted or you are eating meat products which are highly charred, then you are eating a whole host of these chemicals which are very harmful. We have seen how heavy metals can leach into the food because they are a part of containers or processing equipment. We will now learn about plastics that when we use plastics in equipment or as storage utensils then what can leach out. Plastics have additives like plasticizers antioxidants, catalysts, suspension and emulsifying agents, stabilizers and polymerization, inhibitors, pigments, fillers, etc. The extent to which the migration of contaminants into foods occurs depends upon the contact area, the rate of transfer, the type of plastic material, the temperature and the contact time. The migration of substances from plastic into food is also related to the type of the food which is packaged. Alcoholic beverages, edible fats and oils and acidic foods tend to extract substances more readily than dry foods such as cereals and pulses. Bisphenol A also known as BPA and phthalates are two chemicals which tend to leach out of plastic. Bisphenol A is an endocrine disruptor and its use has actually been banned in many countries. Phthalates leach in from food packaging material, tubing and other parts of processing equipment. PCBs or polychlorinated biphenyls are still used in lubricants, coatings, plasticizers and inks. Foods containing animal fat like meat, fish, Eggs and milk tend to have high levels of PCBs. High levels of PCB in the blood have been linked to reduced mental development and suppressed immune reactions, especially in children exposed to PCB in the womb. 
Dioxins are polychlorinated aromatic compounds formed as a byproduct of industrial processes. They persist in the food chain. Dioxins are known to cause cancer in humans and have been linked to severe effects on the brain, reproductive and immune systems. We now move on to biological hazards. These include bacteria, fungi, virus, protozoa and parasites like worms. Bacteria are microscopic organisms which cannot be seen with the naked eye. These can be in different shapes. Round or spherical bacteria are known as cocci. Rod shaped bacteria are known as bacilli. You can also have other shapes like comma shaped known as vibrio, helical forms, corkscrew, filamentous or spirochetes. Contamination of food with bacteria is indicative of low standards of personal and public hygiene. Bacteria are known to cause a number of foodborne illnesses like cholera, typhoid, botulism, shigellosis, etc. Washing all raw ingredients with clean water helps to get rid of surface bacteria. Cooking food at high temperature often kills most of the disease causing bacteria. Refrigerating food when not in use prevents the bacteria from multiplying. Washing hands before eating always helps to reduce the microbial load. The fungi are multicellular and filamentous. A mass of branching intertwined filaments is called hyphae and the entire mass of these hyphae is known as the mycelium. Now the hyphae may grow within or above the food. These may be green, blue, yellow, orange, pink, brown, grey, black etc. in many colors and actually this color is used to identify the mold. These are pictures of molds growing on fruits and on bread. Now these molds produce toxins which are known as mycotoxins. These are examples of some of the mycotoxins which are mostly found in grains. Aflatoxin has been implicated as a cause of liver damage and cancer. Ergot alkaloids cause ergotism which has symptoms of nausea, vomiting, giddiness and sleepiness. Fumonisins are linked to cancer of the esophagus. Trichothecenes cause gastrointestinal upset, nausea, vomiting and diarrhea. Ziarolinone adversely affects the reproductive system of animals. Patulin, found in apple juice, is an irritant to the stomach causing nausea, vomiting, hemorrhage and ulceration. Ocratoxin A, also found in coffee, mainly affects the kidneys. Yeasts are generally a useful fungus, widely used in the food processing industry for preparation of enzymes, for making bread, for making uh, wine, beer. However, some of the yeasts are actually leading to spoilage of foods. Examples include candida, which leads to the spoilage of butter, margarine and foods high in acid and salt. Torolopsis species ferment lactose and may spoil milk products. Rhodotorella causes discoloration of a number of foods. Saccharomyces leads to spoilage of dry fruits, fruit juice concentrates, honey, maple syrup, etc. Protozoa are also microscopic single-celled organisms. The most important disease-causing protozoan is an amoeba called Entamoeba histolytica, which causes amoebiasis. Fecal contamination of food, especially raw vegetable and water, aids in spreading this infection. Depending on the severity of the infection, the symptoms can range from mild diarrhea to serious dysentery and even death. Viruses require living cells to grow and reproduce and hence sometimes are referred to as obligate intracellular parasites. 
Several viruses have been known to cause diseases in humans, namely hepatitis A, gastroenteritis, and poliomyelitis. These viruses are shed in extremely high numbers in the feces of infected individuals. We are exposed to enteric viruses through various routes. Shellfish or fish grown in contaminated waters, food crops grown in land which has been irrigated with either wastewater or sewage, sewage polluted recreational waters like swimming pools and water theme parks, contaminated drinking water. Moving on to worms and helminths. Worms can also cause serious illness in man. Some of the worms which commonly infect man include round worms, tape worms, hook worms and thread worms. The general symptoms of infection are loss of appetite, paleness and abdominal pain. A large number of worms can get entangled and cause intestinal obstruction which may then need to be surgically removed. Here you can see a picture of a tapeworm. Can you see how long it is? In, it kind of fits in the entire length of the intestine. Reducing exposure. Prevention obviously lies in safe disposal of human excreta. Proper cooking of food can destroy microbes and eggs of worms. Maintaining a high standard of hygiene, especially when handling food, is important. Washing hands is perhaps the simplest, but the most important precaution one has to take to avoid all microbial and worm infections. Food handlers should be periodically examined for infection and should be educated about basic practices of personal hygiene. We now come to emerging concerns regarding food safety. To classify something as an emerging concern, either one of these should be there. For instance, the pathogen should be causing a new illness or the number of cases should be now increasing sharply. Pathogens may be spreading the disease over a wider geographical area or the pathogens are showing up in diverse foods in which they had never been detected before. Pathogens are now, which were earlier infecting animals, are now causing disease in humans or antimicrobial resistant microbes. Also of concern is the increase in the persistent bioaccumulative toxins in our environment and food. For instance, the number of people falling ill due to listeria is nearly doubling every year. E. coli 0157 H7 has caused multiple outbreaks of food poisoning. Multi-drug resistant microbes like Salmonella, Brucella etc. are causing major problems. Outbreaks of cyclosporiasis provide another example of a new and novel agent, a protozoan parasite, Cyclospora cayentenensis, that produces prolonged watery diarrhea. Transmissible spongiform encephalopathies are a group of progressive degenerative conditions that affect the brain and nervous system of some animals and humans. These TSEs are also referred to as prion diseases, examples including scrappy in sheep, bovine spongiform encephalopathy or mad cow disease, and in humans, the Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. The infective agent was identified as a prion, a type of a pathogenic protein. Now, this is not a microbe, but it is a pathogenic protein. The infectious agent induces abnormal folding of specific normal cellular proteins. These then accumulate in the brain causing damage like holes or plaques leading to dementia and ultimately death. The scary part here is how these are jumping from animals and infecting human beings. Microplastics Plastic debris in the marine environment, including resin pellets, fragments and microscopic plastic fragments containing a cocktail
cocktail of chemicals and organic compounds is contaminating the fish and other seafoods we eat. United Nations Environment Program actually call these marine plastics the new toxic time bomb. Marine organisms which feed on these plastics then concentrate the plastic additives, pesticides, metals and other toxins. These ultimately land up on our dinner plate. These chemical hazards have been linked to hormonal disturbances, damage to vital organs and cancer in humans. We now come to the preventive measures to improve food safety in general. A focused effort is definitely needed to reduce contamination. Better sanitation and process control for the food industry is important. A robust public health surveillance system needs to be in place. We need to be vigilant about the global food trade and to ensure that other countries do not dump tainted food into our country. Identification of newer challenges is vital. Protocols to deal with food safety emergencies like foodborne disease outbreaks is also important. Effective communication with consumers about risks and ways of managing risks will help. Efficient system for traceability of foods and ingredients is very important to track where the contaminants are coming from. With this we come to the end of the presentation. These are some of the references which I have used. These are the sources of the images used in this presentation. So now let us recapitulate some of the important things that we have learned. Question number one. Which of these is not a chemical contaminant? A. Antibiotic residue in milk. B. Iron filings in tea. C. Pesticide residue in vegetables. And D. All the above. The answer is B. Iron filings are actually a physical hazard which can lead to injury and irritation of the gastrointestinal tract. Question number 2. Which of these is not a physical hazard in food? A. Stone chips in cereal grains B. Animal droppings in flour C. Unpermitted colour in red chilli powder D. Shards of glass in cold drinks Yes, the correct answer is C. Unpermitted colours like Sudan dyes may be added to red chilli powder as an adulterant. This is a chemical hazard which can cause adverse health effects. Question number 3. Which of these is not a disease caused by bacteria? A. Amoebiasis B. Typhoid C. Shigellosis D. Cholera The correct answer is A. Amoebiasis or amoebic dysentery is caused by Entamoeba histolytica which is a protozoa. Typhoid is caused by Salmonella species, Shigellosis by Shigella species and Cholera by Vibrio cholerae which are all bacteria. Question number 4. Bacteria which are round in shape are called a. Bacilli B. Vibrio C. Cocci D. Spirochet The correct answer is C. Bacteria which are spherical or round in shape are called cocci, singular coccus. Question number 5. Which of these helminths is not a food hazard? A round worms, B thread worms, C tape worms, D earth worms. Yes, the correct answer is D because earth worms are not a food hazard. 
they live in soil and do not enter our food question number 6 which of these is not an anti nutritional factor a phytate b oxalate c tannin d shellfish toxin the correct answer is d shellfish toxins are produced by shellfish and consumption of these lead to toxic symptoms ranging from diarrhea to paralysis depending on the type of toxin question number 7 when starch based foods are cooked at high temperatures which harmful chemical is produced a h b heterocyclic amines c acrylamide d nitrosamine the correct answer is c acrylamide is formed whenever foods that contain the amino acid asparagine and any reactive carbohydrate are heated to temperatures greater than 120 degree centigrade in fact a box of french fries has very high amounts of acrylamide question number 8 microplastics in the ocean are a threat to human health because they a litter the beaches b contaminate the fish we eat c kill marine life d none of the above the correct answer is b microplastics enter the food chain when contaminated sea water is consumed by algae and plankton fish eat these as well as taken contaminated water these microplastics accumulate in the body of the fish when we consume these fish we are exposed to the plastics and all the associated chemicals with it question number 9 which type of fish is safer to consume considering that there is bioconcentration of toxins in marine life A round fish B big fish C small fish D flat fish The answer is C small fish will have relatively less heavy metal concentration as compared to large fish The shape of the fish does not determine concentration of heavy metals Question number 10 Veterinary drug residues are undesirable as they may cause a antibiotic resistance b allergic reactions c disruption of food fermentation d all the above The answer is d veterinary drug residues lead to development of antibiotic resistant organisms Some people who are allergic to a particular kind of an antibiotic can also develop an allergic reaction after consuming a food which is contaminated with that antibiotic. Starter cultures for fermented foods like curd, cheese, etc. are also adversely affected by antibiotic residues. This brings us to an end of the presentation. We have learned about different types of food hazards what are their sources of contamination how we can reduce our exposure to these hazards and then eat safe food thank you